Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 615. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and it's August 12th, 2020. All right, I want to welcome you to another program, and today you're going to experience some of what I experienced using the internet while traveling. Um, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin right now, and Madison, a college town, should certainly have fast cell service. It doesn't. I'm on Verizon, and I'm pulling seven down, and I'm pushing two up. And that means when George and I are talking via high-definition cameras over this little cell network here, which is struggling with no students because there's no students at UW right now, he's pausing and he's becoming pixelated. And sometimes there's a little green bar that goes across his eyes. That's not George. That's not the George we know. That's Verizon not doing its job. So I just want to let you know that before we get too started. And I need you guys as participants in Anglican Unscripted to please like this episode when you find it on Facebook or YouTube. Please share this episode with your friends, family, with anybody just and on your Facebook page you can share this right on your Facebook page you click the share button and share it to your Facebook feed that's that's cool you can do that too comment uh, a lot of our enjoyment George and I have as uh, commentators here is to go to comments be sometimes corrected we're a little off sometimes in our facts not too too often like once every six months and the rest of the time, it's just a great discussion that goes on in the comments. So we really appreciate that. If you do not have time to sit in front of your computers and watch two guys who really don't know what they're talking about, talk about it, we have a podcast. You can just listen to us. You can throw us on the iPhone, on your uh, Verizon phone. No, <laughs> but you can, you can listen to a podcast anytime you want. And uh, we'll give you the same content where we really don't know what we're talking. You know, George, I'm looking here in the the camera i got covid hair coming out the side here i need to get a haircut because i i trimmed the top and now it looks like i got bozo the clown uh, sides but that's that's why i shouldn't look at the camera george how you doing down there in florida just wonderful it's a beautiful time of year the crowds have gone but the weather is the weather's uh no better no worse than it is up north except we don't have the crowds right now mm-hmm so I'm having a wonderful time doing a lot of yard work around the church, which is fun. We're, we've had a community gatherings where we've been socially distancing, but weeding and trimming trees, getting ready for when we can come back in person to church. We had an interesting storm. Right after we arrived here in Madison, there's a storm front, uh, which is basically, it's called a Jirachi. I don't know what the Weather Channel calls it. There's some term for it. And it's a line of storms that went from all the way from Madison to below Iowa. And we have friends in, I, in, in like Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Town basically wiped out. No electricity anywhere. Uh, all the trucks on the interstate were turned over. Most of the houses damaged. Most of the trees down. All the cornfields flattened. And so I'd forgotten about stuff like that when I moved out east. Now then back in the Midwest, this, is, this rivals hurricanes, George. So let's talk quickly about the news. In Anglican terms, there is no news. Um, we covered the oh stories my. about, yeah, we, we covered the stories about um, Africa murders last week. We covered Indian corruption last week. Um, and there's not a whole lot to update except for the Tibetan bulls. That's going to be a, 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 a quick, fun story, George, because um, when, when Jesus just doesn't do it for you as a church, you need, you need, to, you need to turn to singing bowls. Well, tell us that story quick. Oh, well, Kevin is right. Uh, Kevin, you're right. Uh, there's just more of the same. Indian corruption, African oppression, communist persecution, uh, Episcopal Church embarrassments uh, but uh, the Anglican Church of Canada on their website announced a workshop of Tibetan singing bowls and how at this Bethlehem 
a retreat center which was set up by the diocese of uh, New Westminster, I believe. It's in British Columbia, where you where you can now go for a week or so and sit cross-legged and with this little bowl make gong noises and hum and connect um, to uh, <laughs> yes, Om Mani Padre Om. And now our good friend and co uh, co fellow here uh, at Anglican Unscripted, uh, David Old, says, "All oh, well in Australia, they've been having chakra stones at Compline services in some kooky churches for a while." And my response is, "Yes, well, Canadians are always a bit slow in the That's uptake, uh, yeah. but now the New Age uh, heresy, paganism." Uh, is now being advertised on the National Church's website. Come and lose your soul, lose your salvation at an Anglican retreat center in British Columbia. I'm um, being flippant, but I just, I personally have an abhorrence of these New Age practices because my experience as a pastor and dealing with older people who have gone through the 60s and 70s is they have just been so damaged by their experiences with the demonic through New Age practices that it just stay far, far, far away from this stuff. One of my little fun news items, it's August, so there's very little. Some photos surfaced of Elizabeth Warren, the senator from Massachusetts, political campaigner, who during college joined a pagan Wiccan group and there are photos of her naked running around hand in hand around a campfire with other naked college students chanting uh, pagan songs. And I just wonder if that has anything to do with her current mindset. But, you know, this stuff is real. You just can't. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be dogmatic. Friends, don't play with Ouija boards. Okay. Don't do this yeah. stuff. And that's the, the big issue we always want to tell people is Scripture warns us, Jesus warns us, the prophets warned us, the Apostle Paul warned us, don't go near it. Not because it's not real, but because it is real. Because it will have a harmful, uh, almost cursing effect in your life. And I have friends who went through the 60s and 70s drug culture, LSD culture, sex culture, and um, many are just completely lost souls because it was an empty high. It was, you know, it's like empty calories. You're fat and you got nothing for it. So I'm going to say things that will hurt some people's feelings, mm -hmm. but labyrinths at church, mm -hmm. labyrinths have no Christian purpose. They're a, they're, a, they're a gateway drug into the demonic. Enograms, you know, based on Jungian philosophy. Jungian philosophy, if Gavin were on the show this week, he could tell us how, you know, demonic and demonstrably so a lot of this stuff is. But you just, when the church, because it has no message left, which is the Anglican Church of Canada, it's got to start some. It's got to start searching for something that allows it to be relevant. And when it reaches into the new age and the demonic, it is accelerating its decline, not only into irrelevance, because you can go to your health club or to the YMCA and do this dumb stuff, but rather it is building Satan's hold even stronger over this broken world. Mm. Um, you know, it's like pornography. Uh, you, you start by looking at dirty magazines at the checkout line, and you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and eventually, before you know it, it's starting to rewire your brain. And I've been working with some men at my church who are, who have, who are struggling mightily to overcome pornography. They're not perverts, they're not sick people, but it's just over the course of time, what once titillated now is boring, and they had to go further and further and further in. And they're realizing it's ruining their relationships with their wives, it's coarsening how they view women, 
And thank goodness they had the strength to ask for help. But, you know, there's just so many things like that that Satan uses to destroy people. No, oh, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, uh, and Satan's able to destroy people from within the church, like the Anglican Church in Canada, uh, for the industries like the porn industry. Uh, politics is very destructive. Um, Satan is always, he doesn't have to look for ways. He has well-patterned ways to get you to fall. And you as Christians, and we, and George and I as Christians, have to watch out for that. Pray for each other. Encourage each other. One of the points of the show is to encourage you. To show you two people of sound mind. That's questionable. Two people of sound mind um, who love the Lord, who are true believers. Uh, relate. Have friendship. Talk about the news. That's you know one of the points of Anglican Scripted. Not always news, but a little bit of our relationship. It's sort of ironic that it took the cancel culture to expose Margaret Sanger. Now, for those who were involved in the pro-life movement, none of what I'm going to say is new or a surprise. But if you're the average American, you don't know this, that the, the Margaret Sanger, the founder, if you will, the lighting, guiding light of the abortion movement in the 20th century, uh, was driven by eugenics, meaning... We're going to purify the population of congenital illnesses and black people, minorities. Yes. We want to have, you know, we are going to reach out and try to reduce the number of black people at, in the United States by killing them in the womb. And the early efforts uh, of Planned Parenthood included reaching out to the black leaders to say, isn't this a wonderful thing that, you know, murdering your children will improve your economic lifestyles and is the right thing to do. So now the leading, you know, here's the joke. If black lives mattered, then you'd shut down Planned Parenthood tomorrow because that has killed more by, multi by factors of millions that any racist uh, group in the United States has done. And it finally took the uh, cancel culture to have the statue of Margaret Sanger taken down. Yet by this time, the culture of abortion is so firmly entrenched in minority communities that in New York City, the majority of non-white births are terminated before uh, completion because that's just the culture that has arisen of killing and it comes out of a, an avowed racist agenda, the same racist agenda that animated the Nazi party in the 1930s and 20s. If you, if you take the 30... Now, none of this is new to people in the, in the pro-life movement, mm -hmm. but for, for many Americans, that, I had no idea. I thought this was just helping that poor college girl uh, who got in trouble and doesn't want her parents to know and, oh, does it prevents her from going to a backroom abortionist well, that's the poster child, but the bread and butter of the abortion industry is killing black babies. If you, you step out and you take the, take the 30,000 foot view of the world, you will find that in politics, black lives don't matter. And you can tell this because they're allowed to gather. They're allowed to riot. They're allowed to have peaceful protest. They're allowed to... Um, in, in these COVID conditions, uh, even though they're gathering, it's mostly white people, but in these COVID conditions, um, they're allowed to gather in huge quantities and spread this disease and, and stuff like that. Um, if you look from the 30,000 foot view, churches really matter because they're closed down. You're not allowed to worship. You're not allowed to sing. You're not allowed to, to do anything that would harm you your your flock and this is just the the 30, foot level of what the governments think is important and don't think is important um either that or they're they're just swayed by the winds of change which, you know which i think it's both so you know i i'm of a, i agree entirely with your bigger point mm -hmm. but i'm but i'm uncomfortable with the course that some people have taken in hitting back and fighting back 
And it's hard because I have not really thought this through where I can give you an intelligent argument. But we had a, you know, the governor of Nevada is a Democrat, and he's actually been a bit more aggressive in his lockdowns, and including uh, telling doctors what medicines they can and cannot prescribe. He, he's a bit of a power freak. And the result is Nevada's got a pretty bad uh, COVID problem yes, compared does. to other states that have been more market-oriented and allowed doctors to do what doctors want to do. Well, one of the things he's done is he shut down all the churches, but he's allowed casinos to remain open. And this, uh, this case went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and in a very discouraging ruling on party lines, with the Chief Justice joining the Democrats again, uh, ruling that the government may uh, treat churches differently than they treat casinos. Um, uh, Judge Neil Gorsuch, Gorsuch wrote a wonderful dissent, uh, which I encourage people to read, basically saying there's nothing in the Constitution that says a casino has greater rights than Calvary Chapel. But I digress. That's but the Ralph 11th Reed, Amendment. Uh, political, of Ralph Reed, the uh, political uh, Christian uh, leader, um, he's not been in the news as much as he was during the Reagan era. Uh, challenged this by holding a worship service in a casino ballroom because you could have this uh in uh, you could have a uh an event in a casino uh but you couldn't have an event in a church and on one level i think ha 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 that's clever but i ask myself is this really how we should be conducting our worship when our worship is not focused at putting our finger in the eye of the governor but in worshiping and glorifying God. Our churches, only churches when they're in buildings. Gavin and I would go back and forth on this point when we talked about the stupid things English cathedrals would do, putting in Stones. a slip and slide or a putt-putt golf course. I thought it was terrible because I thought it was vulgar. Mm -hmm. Gavin thought it was terrible because it was sacrilegious. And it came down to belief in what I called holy stones, that some stones are holier, holier than other stones. And from a traditional Protestant perspective, no, no holier stone, no stone is holier than any other stone, because we look to what Jesus said: "Not on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, for the Samaritans, or in Jerusalem, uh, will God the Father be worshipped, but in me, through me, Jesus Christ the Messiah." Um, I'm not saying those who hold to holy stone positions are uh, idol worshippers, but what I am saying is that. Maybe from my perspective, uh, a lot more relaxed about church. maybe being in Florida where our churches are all so ugly that if they were taken away from us, it really wouldn't matter because they're really right. just <laughs> ugly buildings that smell a mold building. Uh, well, I mean, that's been but, a, an interesting argument for thousands of years. Uh, the New Testament reveals uh, church growth was through house churches. We met in house, mm -hmm. we met in house, we met at house, we met in a house. And that's just, that's the New Testament. That's the Acts. Um, we did, there was no Apostle Paul going around consecrating buildings. He, he was not saying, mm. we're going to take this uh, place and we're going to make it holy. And we're going to consecrate it and we're going to build a church here. That was not the, the message of the Apostle Paul. So, in our Protestant terms, you're right. So. And one of... There's really been some good that's come out of this lockdown. We've not met in my parish for 21 weeks now, where we've had online services. And I have never been busier. I mean, I've neglected so much of my non parish church work because the press of business is so huge. And one of the things I've found is that we burned away sort of that, uh, that uh, group of people the once every four or five weeks people. Haven't heard from them. But those who have been faithful, you know, the two to four times a month people, have become more engaged in the church. And the lay people have taken a strong... It, the, our church has become, if you will, declericalized. Sure. That the people are working with each other, reaching out into with each other, that as a community... 
we may be a little bit stronger. We may have lost 10% due to death and people drifting away because they're not being entertained on Sunday, but that core remaining, I think, is coming out of this much stronger. So that when we do reopen, I think we're going to see, I liken it to having a, a beach ball holding it under the water in your swimming pool. When it shoots out, it's going to shoot out. Now, it may not be the first week or the second week, but I think the spiritual uh, power of focusing people on what is important, is it your building? Is it your committee work? Is it this or that? Or is it your relationship with Jesus Christ and your brother and sisters in Christ? I think this has been a valuable time for the church. And I'm just encouraged by by what I see. I think in in real terms, there are some churches that have figured out how do we grow a church, encourage people, keep the faithful when we can't meet. And a lot of people have met that challenge and done very well. Some churches, the, friend, the, the churches who were about to collapse, they're collapsing. Um, the churches that don't have a gospel message are really struggling. They got Tibetan bulls now. But uh, the, the churches that don't have a gospel message, you know, you can't meet for social club anymore and there's no real need to meet. They're closing down. And I've seen churches in North Carolina and South Carolina and around the world who have met the challenge of, I can't worship together with my people. What do we do? And they found uh, resources and solutions, George, like yours. One of, one of the funny things that has come out of this is I have instituted Compline. Uh, we run it now uh, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday nights at 10 p.m. And I hate to say this because I don't know whether this is good news or bad news, but Compline gets as much viewership as our Sunday morning worship. I love Compline. So, yes. And I get actually offline, I get more interaction with people from our weekday services and from delayed broadcast of Sunday because they watch the Sunday service or I put our Sunday sermon separate from the whole worship service. And I get people writing and asking me questions. A good number of them are not from the parish. So I think there's a new way of doing church that's emerging, and we're basically trying to figure out how to do it. Um, well, well, George, it looks like Verizon is starting to censor you, so well, why don't we wipe out the program? <laughs> I think we talked a, a lot about COVID. Um, listen, guys, uh, I'm traveling up to Door County at the end of this week. I don't know how the cell service is going to be up there, if we're going to have a show next week. This is kind of good because every August, George and I kind of move down to one show a week, or we just don't have any shows. We take a week off. We're not sure how it's going to work next week, but we'll work it out. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, somewhere in back of that green bar. <laughs> and Thank you've you, been bro. watching episode 615 of Anglican Unscripted.